Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Aaron Leflin. I'm the Executive Director of the New Canaan Land Trust, and we are thrilled to present this program um, co-sponsored by Planet New Canaan, as well as the New Canaan Library. Um, just a quick plug for some of our other upcoming events you might have seen on the back table. We have this little quarter pager of a whole host of guided walks that we're going to be hosting, um, kind of co-sponsoring with the library. Everything from tree identification to some firefly viewings to talking about land use history on our properties. So great way to get involved with the land trust and learn a little bit more about our properties. And then if you're interested in getting involved further, we have a newsletter you can sign up for in the back with um, a bunch of other events that we announce pretty much monthly. Um, but now on to the main show. We are excited to be joined by Scott Williams. Um, Scott has his PhD from UConn and received a master's from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Uh, he serves as an adjunct professor at both UConn and the University of New Haven and is currently a um, researcher at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station in New Haven. His research and expertise is in wildlife biology. His focus has been um, specifically on white-tailed deer herds and their impact on native and managed ecosystems, orchards, gardens, and landscape plantings. And today some of that's going to be transferred into his knowledge about barberry, um, ticks, Lyme disease, and sort of the relationship between all three. So without further ado, please help me welcome Scott Williams. Thank you. First off, okay, you can hear me? Good. Well, thank you for having me. And um, for those of you, you probably, if you're here, you probably know what Japanese barberry is. It's a terrible plant. It's photographed here. It's very pretty. Um, it turns a great crimson foliage in fall and has these oblong fruits. You often see it at fast food establishments and gas stations. Um, it's part of the landscaper package there. It's a very stubborn plant, very difficult to kill. And um, in parts of Connecticut, it's taken over our woodland ecosystems. So the research I'm about to present tonight came about kind of on accident. Um, my boss is a forester in Barberry. Because it takes over the forest floor, it really limits forest regeneration and wildflowers because it hogs all the sunlight. So we were looking at different ways of controlling it. And while we were controlling it, we found that we were getting a lot of ticks on us. And that's how this component of this research came to be. Um, so, but first, it didn't poof appear. It didn't just become a problem all of a sudden. It had to build up and so I'm going to give you a little um, history, a forest history lesson in Connecticut and New England, and um, you might pick, you might learn something. You may have already, already know it, but um, it kind of explains how we got to where we are, given the deer, given the mice, given the barberry. All this um, comes together and sort of wreaks ecological havoc and has created the situation that we're currently in. Um, before I get going. Ticks do not carry Lyme disease. Ticks carry Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the spirochete that causes um, Lyme disease in humans and domestic animals. That spirochete is found in the mice, so the mice play a role in the pathogen transmission cycle. So the ticks feed on the mice and get the pathogen from the mouse. Deer do not transmit the pathogen to the ticks, but deer are pivotal in um, the life cycle of the ticks. So where you have a lot of deer, you have a lot of ticks with a lesser infection. So that's just a quick lesson on ecology. I can extrapolate further if you guys have further questions later. Um, but so that's just a tune, a, a theme throughout here. But um, as I mentioned, first we're going to do a quick uh, forest history lesson of Connecticut to explain how we got to the situation we're in currently. Um, so this is a photograph taken back in 1912 in Colebrook, Connecticut. This was the last old, gross, uncut stand of forest in the state of Connecticut. And they brought people out, and they photographed it and documented it, and then thereafter they cut it down. So, um, so we don't have any old growth forest remaining in the state. So it's, people say we do, but it's, the state was virtually denuded of trees at one point, every part of the state of Connecticut. And this is typical of the Northeast um, in New York State, Mid-Atlantic. It's kind of um, these forested regions. So man has, uh, humans have had a heavy, a heavy um, handle on the landscape in, in, in Connecticut specifically. So after colonization, we had agricultural beginnings, meaning we came through 
and humans started to clear some plots for their agricultural land to, just to survive. So you can see in this diorama here, there's, there's some ag land, there's plenty of forest in the background, um, and sort of the forest and the agriculture were working together. But then as time went on, in Connecticut specifically, we did a lot of charcoal production for um, the, the metal industry in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So this is just an example of charcoal production. All these um, trees are cut down, bundled, and turned into charcoal, which burns much hotter. You can smelt um, metals and get the temperature a lot higher than just burning wood in general. So there's a real demand for this, which is why virtually all Connecticut's trees were cut down at one point, which um, just opened up the landscape. Um, so this is a charcoal mound. This is, they have certain dimensions and this handsome man is the collier. He tended this charcoal mound. So they mounded up all the woody material here and then piled earth on top of it, lit it. And this guy's job was to make sure it was deprived of oxygen. So it just smoldered and didn't catch and burn and create. That's how you create charcoal. So to this day, um, in this area, uh, Devil's Den specifically, if you're walking through and if you're familiar with that property, you'll see an odd opening in the forest about 33 feet around. It's an old charcoal pit. And um, because it burned to the ground, not much grows there. If you kick at the soil, you can find little pieces of charcoal. And once you learn to identify them, you'll see them throughout the landscape. They're just these odd flat places in the middle of the woods. Um, pretty interesting and kind of uh, unique to Connecticut's history. And then we had agricultural domination where virtually all the trees were cut down. At one point, I think Connecticut was only 20% forested. Um, trees only existed in draws and river valleys and wetlands and junk land that was unusable. Um, and then at the same time, there wasn't much room for these guys left. And there was unregulated hunting and shooting and we really drove the numbers of white-tailed deer down almost to extinction. Um, scenes like this were not unfamiliar where guys just go out and kill multiple animals. And this was at the time at which humans didn't think they could have an impact on natural resources. They thought they would just sustain and they could continue to do this. Um, similar to our marine fisheries these days where we think we can just keep on pulling from the marine fisheries and not have an impact. But we're starting to see that and we very much saw this. Um, you know, at the end of the 1800s, early 1900s, where in Connecticut, there were newspaper articles if a resident saw a deer. So compare that to what today is pretty ridiculous. So um, I'll get, and then scenes like this. So this is called the world's largest meat pole. And I think there's something like 75 or 80 deer hanging here, but it's just the scope of um, the unregulated, it wasn't hunting, it was, shooting and killing of these animals um, that, again, drove the population down. So you have no forests, and then you have um, all these deer being wiped out, agricultural domination. Um, and additionally, we're removing all the predators from the area. So mountain lions um, were basically extirpated from east of the Mississippi. Um, so this hatched area shows their current range, the darker purple down through South America, and this is their historic range. So, so we're killing all the deer, we're killing the predators, and we're really shaping the ecosystem. Um, and people, I always include this too, and people come at me with, um, you know, mountain lions in Connecticut, there's always the myth that they still exist, but they were, the eastern cougar was declared extinct by the Fish and Wildlife Service, and while there are some exceptions of animals moving from the west and from the north, single animals, there's no reproducing population on the East Coast, aside from one, which is in Florida, the Florida Panthers, So, um, which isn't doing very well. So in addition to cougar removal, we also killed all the wolves as well. So again, killing all the deer, killing all the predators. Um, so that all this green and yellow is the historic range of the wolves, and the green now is the modern day, and these are two um, reintroduced populations in the Yellowstone ecosystem and um, on the Nez Perce Reservation here. And these are doing quite well and getting bigger here. 
and these are moving south. So wolves are doing well, but you can see how they coloni had colonized the Northeast and um, most of the Midwest and Southwest at, at one point. So <coughs> killed all those too. And then, then we realized that you know the soil here in the New England isn't very good for farming. So everyone picked up and moved west and said, all right, we're, it's too rocky here. Uh, and after we've had this heavy-handed um, effect on the landscape, we're just going to abandon it all and go west. So they went to Ohio and, and that way and farmed out there where it's flatter, easier, um, climate's a little more mild. So scenes like this were not uncommon. Um, trees starting to come back, um, farms being abandoned. Um, and people, I've had people in the audience say, how did the farmers get the stone wall between all the trees like that? <laughs> so they can't, and you have to explain them, no, it's just, but anyway, reading the forested landscape is kind of a, interesting to me, and you can see this stone wall, clearly something was happening more modern on this side of the stone wall than on that side. You see older, more mature trees on this side. Um, you see younger trees here, so a lot of these stone walls were to contain livestock, and what happens when the livestock are out there is they, their cloven hooves churn up the soil horizons and mix them all together. Um, so I'm getting a little off topic here, but you'll, in our stands we'll see this area choked, with, and that lends itself to um, invasive um, invasion, infestation. So on some of our research plots, we'd see this just choked with Japanese barberry. And on this side of the stone wall, maybe one or two plants here or there. And so you can really tell that this was goats or sheep or, or cows or something on this side and not so much on that side. So, so this invasive infestations go hand in hand with that um, livestock grazing. Okay, so I've kind of set the stage, and we have some data to prove that what I'm talking about isn't just crazy talk. But so here, this red yellow line is cleared farmland. So back in 1900, about 35% of Connecticut was cleared farmland, and you can see that's been a declining trend, modern till modern day. Now we're well below 10%, where it's just land is too expensive in, in Connecticut to sustain farming of, of this nature. So at the time, farms are declining. Forested area is increasing. So at one in the 1900s, both these are about the same. So as farming decreases, percent forest land increases. So modern day, we're about a little under 60 percent forested in the state of Connecticut, which is pretty heavily forested for an urbanized state um, that we all reside in. And with this um, in change in, you know, this is large scale change in habitat. Uh, animals respond. In this case, the deer responded. So this is, I mentioned, you know, back at the turn of the century, deer, there, if somebody saw a deer, it was written about. In 1900, it was estimated there were 12 deer in the state of Connecticut. So uh, obviously, in the, you can't, obviously an underestimate, but it gives you a, an idea of how few there actually were. And then we start seeing this exponential growth through the 60s and 70s, and then you know dramatic exponential growth to modern day. So these animals are responding to the habitat, the forest. We started to see some um, <coughs> wildlife management laws put into place, um, and, and people understanding that they can have an impact. Uh, now this is a longer term look at percent forest cover here from zero to 100. So this is the primeval forest, and then when we colonized, you can see we cut down the forest. We'd love to cut it down to look like England so we could see our predators and our enemies into the woods. And then it bottomed out here, as I mentioned, and then this is that same window I just showed you, and then we start seeing the forest come back up. So pretty interesting. And right about here in 1875, when forest cover was at its lowest, is when Japanese barbary was introduced. And um, so it came to the Arnold Arboretum in Boston from Japan, and um, people thought it would be great and as a living fence and a great um, replacement for common barberry, which is a different species that was a host to wheat rust. 
So they killed all that, and then this place put this Japanese that wasn't a host to that wheat rust and a threat to the agriculture, the grain um, agriculture. So they were right. It worked a little too good. And so I, I guess my point of when it's at its lowest point is that you have the most light coming in. So it really favors the establishment of this plant. So it, it got established in, in Boston and escaped the arboretum there and then just marched out from there. So all this is happening simultaneously, right? The deer population is increasing. We wiped out the predators. There's nothing to keep them in check. We introduced barberry. When the, um, when the forests are lowest, we're abandoning agriculture. We churned up all the soil horizons and lent itself to um, this um, invasive nightmare. So right here in 1974, in Connecticut, it's when we had the White-Tailed Deer Management Act where the state of Connecticut determined there were enough animals to sustain a regulated hunting season. <coughs> and we can see how well that did in controlling the deer numbers thereafter. So, um, so this, because there were so few for so long, and we saw what humans had done to the deer population, managers were very cautious about over-regulating harvest, not understanding how fecund these deer are. So, by the time they realized there was a problem, it was, it was too late, and they realized how, you know, in places like Connecticut, there's plenty of areas, unhunted areas, where deer can live and reproduce and be just fine. Um, so modern day, there's virtually no regulation in, you can hunt deer in Connecticut for five months, seven days a week, and basically kill as many animals as you want, and we still have a deer overabundance problem. So, and then in 1975, Lyme disease was discovered, quote unquote, here in Lyme, Connecticut. Um, I say it was discovered, actually just I heard about Plum Island on my way over here. People say that's another rumor that it came over from Lyme. But um, if that's the case, then how did the Iceman, who's 5,000 years old, have Lyme disease? This is the uh, Otzi, the ice man they found in the, in the Italian Alps, had Borrelia burgdorferi in his system. So what had happened was Borrelia and Lyme disease evolved with wild animals and early humans. Um, and then, you know, we had fewer deer. We didn't have a lot of ticks. And it, it just sort of emerged in the landscape as we saw those deer numbers expanding. So it's always been out there, but it had been in such low incidences and hadn't, transfer, hadn't transferred over to humans. And seeing that end zootic, what else do I say? Sequence, yeah. Um, so this is the erythemia migrans. This is the bullseye rash on the back of my seasonal worker's leg who was helping me with this research. And this is um, the actual spirochete. This is the that corkscrew shape. This is Borrelia burgdorferi. That's the spirochete that the ticks inject into you and get you sick. Um, so the one we could talk to, dog ticks we've had around for quite a few times. When you guys were younger, that's probably all we had was the dog ticks. They're the big ones you can feel crawling on you and you just flick them off and they're a nuisance. Lone stars are becoming an issue. I won't get into that quite yet. But this is the one we're going to talk about, black-legged ticks or AKA deer ticks, Exodes scapularis. Um, and they're in multiple stages too. So at this time of year, you guys have probably seen the adult females and adult males are just, their activity period is from March till about now. So they're sort of trailing off. And then the nymphal stage is a juvenile stage that's becoming active now. So this guy, they start out as larvae, right? they hatch from the egg, they haven't fed on anything, so they're not infected with anything quite yet. So these guys typically feed on small rodents, mice, chipmunks, squirrels, and they have the opportunity to uptake the pathogens on that first blood meal. They molt and become this guy, the nymph. And this guy is the, one, the life stage that's responsible for most tick-borne illnesses. It's very small. Um, it's active starting now through July beginning of August when you're outside gardening, when you're outside hiking around, when humans are outside enjoying um, the outdoors. And then 
these guys get active, the adults get active again in October, November, December, feed on deer, whatever, lay eggs, and the whole cycle repeats. So these guys are on a two-year life cycle. Um, so they, they overwinter as nymphs, so in the fall they, they feed in the summer as larvae fall off in the fall, overwinter as nymphs, and then hopefully they find a blood meal in the spring and they come out as adults. And um, So any control work you do is going to have lag effects as that two-year life cycle progresses of the tick. Um, I already went over this. So the, right, so there's the life cycle. And there are three host ticks, so they have to feed, fall off, molt, find a new host, feed, fall off, molt, find a new host. Um, so each time they fall off and find a new host is an opportunity that they might not get a blood meal and might die and um, not survive. This is the pathogen life cycle. So the, as I mentioned, the adult lay eggs, larvae hatch, they're uninfected because they haven't fed. The larval feed on the mice have the opportunity to uptake a pathogen on that first feeding, they become nymphs, and then the nymphs have to feed, and they typically feed on smaller animals, and they have a second blood meal for which to bring up the, um, to uptake the pathogen potentially. So about 25% of these guys are infected with Borrelia, and because the adults have had two blood meals, about 45 or 50% of them are infected. But they're bigger um, and easier to spot. The male doesn't feed. The female needs one more blood meal to lay eggs. The male just finds her and mates on the large animal, and then she, he dies and she falls off and lays 2,000 eggs. Yeah, so I've been through this. So the adults are the white line here. They get active February through about now. Um, and then again in the fall, as I mentioned, the yellow line is the nymphs that start up in May peak in June and July and taper off, and then the larvae hatch in the hot months in August, and then. So, okay, so now that you have all that background of the forest history, the deer, the tick ecology and so forth, we're gonna get into talking about the relationship with barberry. Um, so, Japanese barberries native to Japan. A lot of the invasives we have are from Japan because it's on a similar latitude and similar weather to what we have. So it's just other side of the world, similar latitude, um, just with no, it didn't co-evolve with anything that we had here. So why it tends to grow unregulated. It forms very dense stands. If you've I hiked down around here, you're probably already aware of this. It's indiscriminate where it goes. It grows and grow. In forests under dense overstory, it can grow on wetlands and open fields. It can grow pretty much anywhere. As I mentioned previously, it displaces native vegetation and hogs all the light and prevents native regeneration. It reduces the litter layer in forests, which are um, important for nutrient cycling. And it alters soil chemistry as well, it's just the plant itself. So um, it's just a nasty plant. It's good. Thorn, it's, there's just no redeeming qualities of this plant. So, so this is my colleague JP. This is our research plot in Lyme, Connecticut. And at this site specifically, the earth curves, and you can still see the Japanese barberry as the earth is curving in the distance. Um, and one advantage you can see is this stuff leaves out the first in the spring, so about a month ahead of our native birches and maples and so forth. So it's getting full sunlight gets a photosynthetic edge, gets a lot of energy during this time. And then similarly, in the fall, after all these leaves fall off, it still has its leaves photosynthesizing, getting ready to make it through the winter. So it's, uh, and when it first greens up in the spring, it's very evident driving on the parkway, you can really see it into the woods and it just makes you kind of depressed. <laughs> so. so this, yeah, this is our site in Lyme and I've never seen higher tick densities than in Barberry at our Lyme research site. Okay, so I mentioned before that we were doing control stuff and then this sort of um, came off of that, but we had six sites we did the study at. One was up at UConn, um, on the UConn campus. Uh, one was close to here down in Redding, 
on Centennial Watershed State Forest. We had two paired ones down there near the Sagatuck Reservoir. And then similarly, um, South Central Connecticut Regional Water Authority property in North Brantford, we had two plots. And as I mentioned, in Lyme, Connecticut, we had another plot on a private piece of property there. So in each of these six locations, we had three treatments there. We had a full barberry stand, which was an intact stand, which we did nothing to. We just said, okay, this is our research plot in this intact stand. And then we had an area where we managed the barberry through some methods I'm about to talk about. And then in the vicinity, we established an area that had no barberry, like I mentioned previously, like on the other side of that stone wall or just something, literally a stone throw away that just didn't, didn't have the plant growing there. So to treat it at a few of our sites, first we mechanically removed it with this hydraulically driven drum chopper. It's got these carbide teeth and it just, it can mulch up trees. It's pretty remarkable. We did it in winter when the ground was frozen and it left this beautiful saffron color of the barberry. So you take a six to eight foot tall and wide barberry and mulch it down and that's what it looks like afterwards. So our strategy was to remove the above ground portion, the live above ground portion of the plant. Um, and then the plant is stressed out and so what it does is it puts up new shoots and it uses its root reserves to put up those new shoots and then after about a month or two you come back and you hit that stressed out plant with a secondary treatment. In this case we looked at different um, herbicides in this propane, non-chemical propane backpack where we burned it like that which was fun for about 20 minutes but then it got quite old. Um, but um, and then we did one plot where we didn't do any follow-up treatments. Uh, and then due to, uh, we were working on water companies and so one of them didn't want us to do um, any chemical application. So we did a burn treatment initially, followed up by a burn treatment secondarily. Um, so as I mentioned, this was non-chemical. Um, but was fairly labor intensive. And we're doing it out in the rain too, so I'm soaking wet in this picture and burning, inhaling fumes, smoke and stuff. And then to get the tick counts, we dragged this one meter square cloth in our various treatments, and we did it on several occasions um, of a known area in either one, so we could get a density comparison. And this is old, but basically we had, we, this is old data, but we wound up with like 8,000 ticks or something that we sampled. So no small effort. Uh, and um, we sampled them all about 300 times. So this was, you know, a big scale. We did this over 10 years. And um, so it's pretty, pretty striking and the results are pretty meaningful. And then once we got the ticks, we brought them back into the lab and we stored them for a bit and then you can take their guts and you smear them onto a microscope slide and then you add this hocus pocus to it and uh, you can stain the Borrelia and you can physically look at it under a microscope um, and determine whether or not that tick was positive for Borrelia burgdorferi or not. So we, I had my lab techs do that to every single tick we got so we can get an infection rate and a density of ticks in our various treatments throughout different portions of the state. Um, this is my boss's rendition. So basically, ultimately, what happened is uh, in forests where barberry didn't exist, there were 10 infected ticks per acre. And then, and that's me, I'm pretty tall, so you can imagine what's going on there. So, but in um, forests where barberry was present, there wasn't 10, but it <laughs> wasn't 50. So each one of these represents 10 ticks per acre. There was 126 infected ticks per acre. So it's on about 14 times more infected ticks in barberry infestations than in healthy forests. So, and that's, and then when we went through and managed the barberry through our various treatments that we talked about previously, um, we were able to get that down to about a 40 to 60% reduction, which would be longer, more if we brought that out over more years.
of sampling. So um, as I mentioned, it takes a couple years for the, because of that two year life cycle for the tick numbers to decline. Again, this is my boss's rendition here. So, so in barberry infestations, this is what you have over 120 ticks per acre. Where barberry doesn't grow, you have 10. So which one would you rather go hiking through? So presumably this one. So, um, so the next question, we found this association. We want to know why. Like why the heck was this going on? Um, we weren't quite sure. We had some, we speculated why. Ticks quest, like this ticks in, in the picture, it stand, holds onto vegetation with its back legs and just holds out its forelegs, hoping in hopes that something comes along and then it just grabs onto them. They don't jump, they don't fly, they don't spin webs, they don't have parachutes, they just go up and down the grass and whatever vegetation in hopes that something comes by. So we thought maybe the barberry was good questing habitat. It's about deer height, I like to say, so maybe they are just going up and down on the barberry stems, hoping a deer came by. Um, and we thought maybe the deer preferred barberry. We thought maybe the mice preferred barberry because if you're a mouse and you're be constantly being threatened by birds of prey or foxes or coyotes, what better place to live than a thorny, shrubby mess? Um, and then uh, maybe Ticks require humidity to survive. So if it gets the humidity gets too low, they just have to retreat to the leaf litter to stay um, hydrated and not die. So we thought maybe that maybe the barberry was doing something with the with the microclimate as well. So on some of the plots, we because we mowed we mowed it down and mulched it up and got rid of it on some plots. But in the other ones where we burned it, the, it, the, it was dead, but it was still standing. So we were able to look and see if it was that questing habitat or not. And we found no difference between where it was standing dead or mulched. And then do deer prefer barberry? Of deer, I've worked with deer for a long time, and they always surprise me. But the one thing that they're consistent with is they never eat Japanese barberry. They won't eat it. So they'll eat the fruits. I've watched them eat the fruits in winter when nothing else is available, but they will not eat the vegetation. So, I mean, they could use it, and they do use it, and they make trails through it, but they're not really opting to spend more time in barberry infestation. Um, do mice prefer barberry? We, I had a PhD student look at this and look at our research, and she found that mice are habitat generalists, and their populations are basically equal regardless of the habitat. They fluctuate year to year based on acorn abundance and things, but between forests or barberry stands or residential areas, it's ubiquitous across the landscape. So that wasn't it either. So then are barberry stands more humid? Yeah, we thought there was something here. So we took a temperature and relative humidity reading hourly for like six months for the growing season over five years, I think, at a foot off the ground and at three feet off the ground. Um, in each of our full barberry managed and no barberry stands. Oh, sorry, not hourly, half hourly. So every half hour, I took a temperature relative humidity reading for five years. So 85% um, relative humidity is sort of the threshold at which below the ticks have to retreat into the leaf litter to stay hydrated. Anything above that, they're perfectly happy and do just fine. So where the green line here is where barberry didn't exist. So you can see from September on, it was below that threshold of 85% relative humidity. Where we managed it was a little higher, but followed that same trend. And where the barberry was intact, the red here, you can see the majority of the time of the year, it was above this 85% relative humidity threshold. So if you're a tick in a barberry stand, it's humid all the time and you're doing just fine and you can stay out there and quest and wait for a deer or, or a host to come by. And if you're spending versus if you're no barberry around and it's not humid, you're spending the majority of your time just surviving in leaf litter. And if you're down there just surviving, you're not able to get a host. You're not able to you know, move on to the next life stage. So in a more humid environment, the ticks are going to do much better. Um, this is vapor pressure deficit, which takes both relative humidity and temperature into account. It's basically how much moisture, how much more moisture the air can, can take in. Um, and so 
basically, this is the barberry stand. So there, it was so humid, there wasn't much more moisture that the barberry could take in versus where we managed it and where it was controlled. High vapor pressure deficit is much more hostile to tick, abund to tick survival. And then here, no, so this is just an example. So in, our, in 2000, July and August 2009, 0%, zero hours of the day in Japanese barberry was it below that 85% relative humidity versus where barberry didn't grow about a third of the day was um, below that. So 33% so of their day, the ticks are just surviving and not seeking out hosts. And I like to say it's because the barberry grows in an umbrella-like structure that shades out. So at night, humidity levels go up to about 100% relative humidity. And then if you're a barberry plant under the shade of the canopy, so it's two canopies, the forest canopy and then the barberry. And beneath there, it's just very humid and it retains that humidity throughout the day. Um, so this is the cultivated version of the plant that's purple. And when it escapes and reseeds, it grows this greenish color. So you can see this at this McDonald's. This has grown and lost that purple cultivar coloration and taken on that wild form. So, and it's patchy. It grows in these patches throughout the landscape. So ticks are doing just fine here, and there might be a pocket here and a pocket over there. Um, so in, in conclusion, I went through this a lot faster than I thought I would, but that'll give us plenty of time for questions. But in conclusion, Japanese barberry is invasive. It's not, doesn't belong here, um, and it tends to spread. I should mention too, under the forest canopy where um, sunlight is limited, it spreads by layering, which is where a branch comes down and touches the ground. That branch can form roots and then create a new plant that can then do it. So it sort of leapfrogs into the woodlands without having to create seed. And it creates these dense infestations like you can see here. So this is likes disturbed areas. I mentioned those soil horizons being mixed or flooding or scouring or stuff like that. Um, it loves that and readily takes hold in those areas. It alters soil chemistry. It alters the um, leaf litter, which a lot of native animals require. Um, it limits forest regeneration just by hogging all the sunlight. Um, it retains that daily relative humidity, which increases black-legged tick survival. And we also saw increased Borrelia infection, as you saw in ticks within those stands, 14 times more than in no barberry stands. And it just really increases Lyme disease risk. So um, I guess the highlight of this is a lot of the public looks into the forest and they see green and they think, you know, the woods are green. but you know, when you start looking at this plant specifically, this plant is bad. This, people start paying attention when they realize this plant can get them sick or their kids sick or their pets sick. And it just gives sort of scientific public health justification for management of this plant on whether it be private or municipal lands or land trust property, what have you. Um, so anyway, so this was quite a success. We put out a bunch of papers on this. And um, so now if you Google barbarian ticks, this is law, this is the law now from our work here. So I think all 50 states are using our work now for justification for managing this plant um, based on these four papers we put out. So I, I didn't bring out handouts. I do have a lot of information. I have these various papers we published. I have um, some fact sheets. I have you know what homeowners can do and how best to manage the plant and all that. Feel free to email me. It's just scott.williams at ct.gov, or you can find me on the Kinetic Agricultural Experiment Station webpage. Um, I'm happy to share with you anything. And um, thank you very much for having me. So, how do we get rid of it? Um, oh. It's, yeah, it's expensive. It's, I say you have to be more stubborn than the plant is. So it, it, on, on acres and acres, if you're managing 40, 50 acres, you need equipment and uh, um, either a brush hog or hire it out or something. And it's, um, 
you just in the, the two, that two-step process, though, you have to mulch it or take off the live portion of the stem, weaken the plant, let it re-sprout, and then go and hit that weakened plant, and you'll see increased mortality of that plant. I have information on that, too. That's a, I just thought about the next several weeks cutting down a couple of thousand each one. Cutting down one new leaf rock of one blade. With the chainsaw, we're doing two gigs of the blades and then cut it. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, so when you're managing this plant, just beware that, you know, it is tick habitat, and just pretty much anywhere in Connecticut is tick habitat, and uh, what I didn't mention is if you cut it down a single time and don't do anything afterwards, it's sort of, it's like steroids. It just says, all right, well, let's do this, and it just grows up even bigger next time. So if you're going to do it, cut it once, you just have to make sure, you, like I say, more stubborn. Repeated cuttings might work if you're averse to herbicide. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but just, yeah, keep at it. Be more stubborn than the plant. I saw a question. Yeah, hi. I, I live on the wetland, and, it, I mean, I just live here. I grew up on the property and then came back in 2004 and put the system on lawn. And every year, I see the bug eggs being multiplied by at least a third to the point where it's just significant. And I'm on some river front, long, long line of property, and I've had one or two of them. You don't want to go out and garden, but right. I do. I kind of have to. And it's this type of land. It's yeah. kind of hard to get a crop off down there. And, and it's wetlands. Well, that's tricky. All right. So, yeah. I mean, can I do this? There are wetlands formulated. So, like glyphosate, I know that's got a bad name now, but it really, these, it's the only tool they really to do on these plants. But it's not the glyphosate that's toxic to the aquatic um, invertebrates and animals. It's the, actually the surfactant within the terrestrial version of um, Roundup that's toxic to them. So you can get aquatic versions that doesn't have that as surfactant for labeled for use in aquatic systems. So that's an option or the propane, but if you're talking about acres and acres, you'd have to probably hire it out to a company who specializes in that, who would do something like I just mentioned. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think each town would regulate that differently based on the fire company, and you'd have to check your local ordinance for that. But um, definitely not in the spring. April is typically when we are, have high fire areas. When it's most humid in summer and after rainy days, I would recommend doing it then. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take responsibility if you set your neighborhood on fire. So. Oh, sorry, front row. How long can a tick live without a blood meal? Um, I think about, about a year or two, and then so, so they so they require it just to go on to the next life stage, and if they don't get it, they'll hunker down and ultimately they'll die. But it, it's a while; it can be a while. So why were I um, ME number one for the leaf that split from? Oh. Yes, those are going to take over the. So this study was, we get this criticism a lot saying, did you look at this? No, we didn't. We didn't. We just looked at barberry. But it's not the plant specifically that has this association. It's the way it grows, this umbrella shape, this clumping pattern. And nothing really native grows in a similar fashion. People have talked about huckleberry or blueberry, but those tend to grow on drier, less hospitable sites that wouldn't really necessarily have a tick problem. Um, and actually, as a result of our research, people have looked at stiltgrass, multiflora rose, honeysuckle, looked at associations with not only ticks, but mosquitoes and other vectors for other diseases, and are finding similar things to we are, mostly because of that humidity component. Anything that grows in a dense clumpiness has got to retain that humidity and promote survival of some of these vectors that can get us sick. Wait, how about way in the back? Um, I don't want to get into that because there is a lot of hype about glyphosate now and $2 billion, like, um, but it's really the only, it's, 
it's a lot of it is fictitious and popular science based on social media, is my opinion. But um, it's really the only thing that can stem the tide of these invasives is chemical control. Yep, I'm a licensed applicator, and I've killed lots of stuff with license plates. I'm sorry, right here. Right here. Mm -hmm. The tri uh, they both had equal kill. Glyphosate's a foliar spray, so it has to the leaves have to be on for it to carry through. And the point of us cutting it down initially and then coming back and applying it is that you're applying a less, much lower volume of chemical onto these plants because you're taking this plant that's six feet tall and six feet wide and you're creating a plant that's about this big. And so you're just hitting that little area with it. So you're not getting a lot of overspray. Trichopleur is um, carried through the bark. So you can carry that, do that in a dormant season. But you tend, because it's sticky and twiggy, you tend to get a lot of overspray with that. And a lot of the chemical winds up on the ground, which isn't what you're looking for. So um, the burning was more expensive um, and nearly effective, but didn't have the same long-term effects as the chemicals did. So really, I mean, if you, again, if you're talking 40, 50 acres, it's unfortunately you just have to use chemicals. That's the, really the only, only solution if you actually want to solve the problem. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, let me talk about the other diseases aside from Lyme. Babesia, my, babesiosis is a new one that's emerging. Um, we're seeing a lot more of the ticks being infected with that one, so I'd say that's secondary to Lyme. Anaplasma is another one, um, which is synonymous with their lichiosis. They're very similar. Um, a new one is Powassan virus. Um, so those three I mentioned are kind of historic, but they're um, emerging with similar patterns as Lyme disease, like radiating out from Connecticut and becoming more and more um, pervasive. Powassan virus um, is found in the mouth parts of the tick. So when the tick, it can feed on you for 15 minutes and you could transmit Powassan virus to you. Um, Connecticut's only had one confirmed case of it and it was in an infant a couple years ago who was treated successfully for it. Um, but the other pathogens, Borrelia, Babesia, Anaplasma, are all found in the gut of the tick, which be, due to tick physiology, it takes 24 to 36 hours of feeding on you for it to ultimately regurgitate its stomach contents into you. And that's how those pathogens get into you. So if you find a tick crawling on you or one that's just started feeding or um, crawling on your dog, it's not, you're, you're not at risk. Um, which is why we advocate tick checks right after you've been in the woods so you can get them quickly. If you do find one on you, you could su submit it to your local health department who will then submit it to us for testing and we c for free of charge and we c will tell you what pathogens the tick has so you can be aware and um, look for any health symptoms as a result of that tick bite. Um, sorry, the other question is Lone Star ticks. Sorry, Lone Star Tick is a new species of tick. Um, it's a southern tick. It's about 90% 90, 90 of the tick bites in the southeastern United States are from Lone Star Ticks. We're seeing them come up the East Coast. Um, there's, they're established on Long Island, and the islands in Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island, now Cape Cod in the islands. And we just found a reproducing population of them in Norwalk, not far from here. Um, and we're picking them up with more frequency. Um, they carry a whole, they have a different activity cycle, they're active at different times of the year, um, and they carry different pathogens, but one of which is the scariest to a lot of meat eaters is this red meat allergy, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. So the tick puts into some kind of sugar into you that reacts six hours after you consume red meat and causes anaphylaxis in humans, and it's awful. So majority of guys who are out are outdoors people and tend to be meat eaters, so this is kind of a death sentence for those people. What's the incidence of um, <coughs> ticks in grassy, mowing area in the sun? 
So that's a misnomer. That's um, a lot of folks think that's tick habitat, but that's like a tick desert. That's that's not tick habitat. What you might find there are dog ticks, which are the larger ones I mentioned in passing that. Um, carry very few pathogens that really aren't of concern. Deer ticks, as I mentioned, need shade, need humidity, so the area you're describing, if you do encounter a tick, it's likely a dog tick and you likely have nothing to worry about. Pachysandra. Pachysandra, uh, right, so <laughs> Pachysandra tends, people plant it, tends to grow around the houses and foundations and stairways and stuff and um, that's dense, right? That's a great place for ticks and mice prefer they can scoot around underneath there and tends to be, um, yes, a very good mouse and tick habitat. Do you recommend people plant them on the sprays they want or just the synthetic? Um, so a lot of those sprays are, the ones that are effective are the synthetic ones that tend to kill a lot of other ins beneficial insects too. Um, so there's a move to more less toxic ones that are more um, friendly. So a lot of them are pushing cedar oils and some of these more natural products, which don't kill the ticks. It sort of repels them temporarily. So um, there are a few products that biopesticides, one we're using now, it's a, um, called MET52. It's kind of difficult to obtain, but it's a biopesticide. It's a fungus that is virtually organic and it um, adheres to the tick and multiplies on the tick and overwhelms it and kills it. So that's nearly effective as those synthetics and um, in our trials when we explain that to people they're really um, receptive to that and permit the spraying of that fungal spray. Um, but that's up to you. Um, we could spray water on people's properties and they say oh it works great you know but um, but I just realized that a lot of the more natural products are just repel it temporarily for a couple weeks and then you ask the guy to come back, he does another application for another couple weeks and then, um, so there are some, and then you have to keep in mind that tick life cycle too, the activity cycle too, so they'll spray a couple weeks and you won't see any ticks because their activity peak has passed and they're no longer active, not because of the spray but just because of their biology. But we have information on that too if you want stuff further. Let's go way in the back. Do you know goats? The goat, we were just talking about that a little before. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know of anything that eats barberry. You could try, let me know if it works. But what I understand from my friend who has goats is they love multiflora rows. <laughs> so that's all I know about goats. But that, that's been a a natural solution, but you have to worry about coyotes and predation and, main, and containing them. But if you want to go that route, that's much better than chemicals. Yes, so there's um, there's a native barberry that I've never seen that I don't know much about. There is common barberry, which is Berberis vulgaris, that has it grows um, not as bushy but more leggy. It grows up more prostrate upright um, and has a longer fruit stalk and then those two actually hybridize and they can put off a hybrid plant too that has similar characteristics of both. Um, so Japanese barberry was brought in as I mentioned previously to um, take the place of the common barberry which was the carrier for that wheat rust. Um, but common barberry does still exist on the landscape in a much lesser abundance than Japanese, but it is out there. I, I think some of the ticks are pulled out when they turn the corner. I think when they're dried up. Um, I don't know. You'd have to ask our our tick lab scientist uh, if they if they haven't obtained a blood meal from you. You've got nothing to worry about. So if they're if they're flat and not bulbous with full of blood, then you're not then you don't have anything to worry about. So the sprays like just a tick off or you know a spray can or they spray on your clothing. Are those effective? Anymore? So those there's a chemical called permethrin, which um, some is the active ingredient. In some of those sprays that um, you spray in your clothes, you let your clothes dry. And then when ticks crawl on you, it's not only repels them, but ticks will die when they crawl on you. So you can do it yourself or you can purchase clothing. Uh, we've been purchased it from a company called Insect Shield that um, has it impregnated in, in the clothing and it's good for up to 70 washes. So um, 
I bought that for my crew at this site in Norwalk where the Lone Star ticks are. It's awful. They're so it's like nightmarishly bad. So uh, it's and if you're gonna do anything, buy the treated socks. So when you pull uh, up over your pants, the weave of the socks, um, the ticks have trouble navigating that, and it increases the exposure time to that permethrin, and the ticks wind up dying. That's the, like aside from the tick check. That's the, I'd say go with those treated clothing. That's it's worked well for us. Um, I, no, I didn't do anything. I've had it like six times. So, but I, so we would just, my crew and I are like picking ticks off each other and looking and people. And so we're just, we're, we're very high risk. So we're very aware and we're just constantly checking each other. And, um, one, one or two gets through periodically, but now, like I mentioned with that, um, with that horrible site, I do the treated clothes. So, um, I treat my, you can buy permethrin on Amazon, concentrated stuff, and soak your pants in it, hang them out to dry, and once they dry, it's good for about six washes. Um, but it really, uh, to permethrin, it's, no, it's, um, I don't know much about it, but it's, if you could look at the MSDS label, and it's, it's very inert to humans, it's, it's very good, but you don't, again, you want it, I think it's, it's toxic to cats, Cats, it's not good. Cats don't mix. So if you have cats, just keep the clothing separate from your cat. Isn't this the active ingredient that can cause um, dermatology and cause cancer? Ah, boy, so many questions. I don't know. How about way back over here? How to pull it out? You don't, you want to, yeah, you want to pull it out with pressure, but you don't want to jerk it out because it could leave the mouth parts in, and it could get infected. You want to pull it out if you have tweezers or something. Get right up close to your skin where those mouth parts are and gently pull it out with with force. Don't snap it out or else you'll break off that head. Um, no, that's the best way. It's just to physically remove it either with your fingers if you have nails or with a pair of tweezers or something. Um, for testing, our the ag station we test them for free. Uh, we test it currently. We test it for Babesia, Anaplasma, and Borrelia, not different strains of Borrelia. I think we're working on refining that. But um, as I mentioned previously, if you submit the tick to your health department, they will then submit it to us through that channel, we'll test it for free and get back to you within a matter of days. I'm sorry, we're the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, but um, your health department will know. If you bring a tick to them, they, they know the proper channel. We've got time for one or two more questions. So. Sure. Um, it would have to be the brush one you would buy. I think it's like a yellow. It has a, it's got a mixture of both glyphosate and the triclopyr in it. Um, the stuff that just has glyphosate, there, it, it'll say on it, it's for brush, brushy stuff. The stuff that's for grassy and leafy herbaceous stuff isn't, isn't concentrated enough. Yeah. Um, uh, you can buy some of these tick sprays that have that permethrin in it that you can spray on your clothing, and, and that it's. But not deep. No, deep isn't as effective on ticks. That's more effective on mosquitoes. So permethrin is the product you want to look for, and it's and most of these ones that are labeled for use on ticks have permethrin in it. Um, you have to check, right? So I mean, right. And I'm, if other folks have questions, I hate to keep everyone here, but if you have other questions, feel free to come up and, and ask me. Thank you, Scott. Yeah.